So you're still thinking about moving down south to Florida. Maybe you watched my first video that talks about the main reasons people avoid Florida or videos from other creators on YouTube talking about the good, bad, and the ugly of living here. If you're on the fence, you've come to the right place because I've added six new reasons to the list suggested by viewers like you in the comments section from my first video, which blew up to over 250,000 views, which is wild. So for those of you who watched, thank you. If you haven't seen it yet, here's the link to that video. Regardless, I recommend you watch this video and take notes before making a decision that you might regret. Quick disclaimer. I am not anti-Florida and I have lived here in the Sunshine State for over 30 years. Naturally, there are things that I don't love about living here but wanted to give you the honest truth from a local's perspective. For some reason, I'm getting a lot of comments asking why I live here if it's so bad. To clear the air, I love living here but that doesn't mean there aren't things in Florida that most see as negatives. There are definitely negatives here like anywhere, especially if you're coming from New York, New Jersey, California, or even the Midwest. As a realtor, this is where many of the people that we help come from. And there's definitely a huge lifestyle, climate, and cultural shift depending on where in Florida you move to. And it's extremely important that you know of all the possible negatives of living here. That way you can be better prepared before moving your life down south and know that it's not always paradise 24 seven. My goal is to bring you the good Good and the bad. This video is part two of the bad. Stay tuned for part two of the good in the near future. If this is your first time here, welcome. On this channel, it's mostly real estate sprinkled in with lifestyle. If you want to learn more about what life is like in South Florida, then subscribe below. Tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to learn about the current market in South Florida. My name is Jonathan. My team and I, we get calls, texts, and social media messages from people just like you every single day that are looking to make the move down to Florida. We absolutely love being able to help. So if you're looking to make a move next week, next month, or next year, we got you covered. Give us a call, send us a text or an email, find me on social media to make your move here a reality. Check out our website, jalexandergroup.com. So let's get into it right now. Here are six lesser known negatives of living in Florida, according to a local who has lived here over 30 years. In my video that outlines the positives of Florida, I talk about our beautiful beaches and how it's obviously one of the top reasons why people choose to relocate there. But there's definitely a dark side, or should I say a red side. And what I'm referring to is a phenomenon called red tide. Imagine saving up for years to finally move to the Sunshine State only to be greeted by a red tide nightmare. The beaches you've been dreaming about are closed. The water is a ghastly red brownish hue and the air is thick with a toxic stench of decaying fish. Not exactly the postcard perfect paradise that you signed up for, right? We can thank the algae Karenia brevis for the unwelcome surprise. And just like a real life Karen, it loves to ruin everyone's fun. Unfortunately, we can't just ask to speak to the manager to make it go away. This pesky algae overgrowth produces toxins that wreak havoc on marine life from fish to dolphins and even our state's beloved manatees. And when these toxins enter the food chain, the effects on the ecosystem and the local economy can be catastrophic. Now, if you're set on moving to the west coast of Florida in particular, let me warn you, Cape Brevis is a frequent guest of honor in the Gulf of Mexico every late summer and fall. It's a common sight between Clearwater and Sanibel Island, but don't be surprised if it shows up anywhere in the Gulf, down to the Keys and across the way to Texas. And how long does this red tide last? Well, it can stick around for a few days or stretch over hundreds of square miles for three to five months. But wait, there's more. Sometimes it overstays its welcome, continuing to pop up sporadically for up to 18 months and spreading across thousands of square miles. Plus, let's not forget about the health risks that it poses to us humans from respiratory issues to eye irritation and more. Not a great situation for those with asthma, allergies, or breathing problems. So if you're looking for a beach party that won't make you sick, 
maybe skip the Cape Brevis and head to the east coast of Florida. Because let's face it, no one wants Karen as their neighbor. So that brings us right to the next negative truth about living in Florida, which is allergies and mold issues. Well, as someone that has suffered from allergies and asthma my entire life, I can tell you that allergy season here feels like it's all year long. There's not really a break from allergens here. However, the period between March and May is considered the peak season for allergies, while those who suffer from severe seasonal allergies may experience symptoms from February to September. So what are the common Florida allergens that we should be concerned of? There's flower pollen, grass pollen, tree pollen, ragweed pollen. Sorry if I missed the pollen. Then there's mold, dust, other seasonal allergens, dander from wildlife, and allergic reactions from insect bites like fire ants and mosquitoes. According to the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, multiple cities in Florida ranked as the most challenging places for people to live with pollen allergies. Major cities in Florida that made it in the national top 20 are Sarasota, Cape Coral, Orlando, Miami, Palm Bay, and Tampa. So if you are ready to get pollen punched by mother nature, then definitely move to Florida. Did you know that tree pollen season in Florida can last for a whopping five to six months, starting as early as late December and running all the way through May? That's longer than most relationships here in South Florida. Now, those of you that didn't pay attention in school might be wondering what all this pollen business is about. Well, trees use pollen to transmit their DNA from the male part to the female part. Yes, it's their form of mating, but unfortunately, we can't ask them to take it elsewhere. So we're left with a light dusting of gold on our cars and a sneezing fit all season long. So which trees are the main culprits during tree pollen season in Florida? You might be surprised to learn that it's not the pretty flowering trees, but rather the trees like pine trees, American elms, bayberry trees, bluejack oaks, maples, which are actually one of the first trees to start pollinating, and river birch to name the most common culprits. There's definitely other trees that cause people issues depending on exactly where you live in the state. If you are highly allergic, you may want to look deeper into which plants and trees affect the regions you're interested in moving to. I'm not listing every single one in this video, but definitely search Google and be in the know. Our state is also affected by something called Saharan dust. It's basically dust from the Sahara Desert in Northern Africa, which can be transformed transported thousands of miles through the air by high-speed winds generated by thunderstorms and cyclones. The fine particles travel across the globe, reaching countries such as Europe, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, and parts of the United States. In the United States, the peak season for Saharan dust transported to the country is typically from late June through mid-August. The areas mainly affected by this phenomenon are Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Southern Continental States, including Florida and Texas. Saharan dust can have a significant impact on air quality, which can lead to respiratory problems and allergies. The tiny particles in the dust can irritate the lungs and airways, exacerbating conditions such as asthma and bronchitis. But you can monitor Saharan dust activity through websites with satellites online and take appropriate measures during peak periods of transport. I've said this in my last video, and it will not be the last time that I emphasize Florida is humid and damp. It's a tropical environment and the number one state to find mold. We are the second most humid state in the country following Alaska, surprisingly. And we get a ton of rainfall, storms, flooding, and all those factors can cause mold growth. Before I scare everyone, I wanna let you know that mold is everywhere and can be found in homes throughout the country. And you're probably breathing it in right now. Now, with that being said, over 50% of homes in Florida to have visible mold growth and over 85% of homes have at least one type of mold present in the air. Is that necessarily a problem? Yes and no. It depends on the type of mold, if it's toxigenic, allergenic, or pathogenic, and whether or not you are someone that is highly sensitive to the stuff. Exposure to toxic molds like black mold can cause a range of health problems, including allergic reactions, asthma attacks, respiratory infections, migraines, autoimmune diseases, and other nasty side effects. According to a report by the Insurance Information Institute, Florida has the highest number of mold claims in the United States, with 10,617 claims in 2019 alone. This represents 24.7% of all mold claims in the country, many from water damage from storms and hurricanes, which is another reason we are one of the top states with the most expensive homeowners insurance. 
Hurricane Ian in 2022 left a trail of destruction across Southwest Florida. Homes were flooded and residents have been left dealing with the aftermath of the storm since then, including severe mold issues. If water damage is left untreated, mold will spread quickly in as little as 24 hours. To recognize the increasing threat, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, extended their disaster aid support to include mold growth. This program has paid out 142.9 million to 95,000 households since its inception. These figures do not even include the damages caused by hurricanes Fiona and Ian. So yes, mold is a risk here, but there's ways home buyers and homeowners can be preventative. My first piece of advice is that if you are someone that is highly allergic to mold, severely immune compromised, you should consider getting a mold inspection done prior to purchasing a home. But like I stated earlier, it's gonna be highly likely that you find some sort of mold on the report. And that doesn't always mean that the home has a mold problem and that it's an unlivable condition or the house is gonna kill you. Now, if you are someone that is deathly allergic to mold and would find any type of findings on a report unacceptable, then in all honesty, you probably should just avoid Florida altogether and move to a place with less humidity like Salt Lake City, Utah. If mold can be found in most homes, it's also gonna be found at banks, schools, businesses, so you need to have a realistic expectations if you are someone that is highly sensitive. If you are not one of those individuals, then don't worry, there are ways to live in Florida and prevent mold from infesting your home and impacting your health. To minimize the risk of mold growth in your home in Florida, it's important to take some preventative measures. One of the first things you should do is to have a home inspection done. Even if there is no visible mold, an inspector can identify potential issues like leaks in plumbing or roofing or sprinklers hitting walls that could lead to mold growth in the future. This allows you to make repairs before the problem gets worse and potentially more expensive. In addition, you need to stay on top of your home maintenance. Given the humid climate in Florida, mold growth can easily happen and spread quickly making remediation a costly process. By regularly cleaning and checking for water damage or leaks, you can catch any issues early on and prevent them from turning into bigger problems. Another nuisance in Florida are bugs. I know, I already mentioned the bugs in the first video, but I'm here again to mention we have even more bugs than you have imagined. Thanks to those that left me comments, we are adding more bugs to our list and will continue to do so because you keep bugging me asking for it. See what I did there? Well, today we are starting off with an extra annoying insect. Love bugs are a common sight in Florida, especially during their mating season in the spring and fall. They are these small black flies with a distinctive red spot on their thorax. They get the name love bugs because they often fly in pairs attached to each other at the abdomen, which can sometimes make them difficult to swat away. Their swarming behavior can be a hazard for drivers as they often fly low to the ground and can coat windshields and car grills, obstructing visibility and causing damage to paint and engines. While love bugs can be a nuisance, they don't bite or sting humans and are not known to transmit any diseases. The love bug population in Florida Florida has been on the rise in recent years, possibly due to changes in the environment and weather patterns. To minimize the impact of love bugs, experts recommend keeping car grills and windshields clean and using a high pressure hose to remove the insects. Additionally, reducing outdoor lighting at night can help reduce their attraction to certain areas. Midges, also known as noceums or sand flies, are tiny flying insects that are common in Florida and other coastal areas. These pests are so small that they are often difficult to see, hence their name, noceums. They are most active during the summer and fall months, particularly in humid and rainy conditions. Midges are known for their painful and itchy bites, which can leave red welts on the skin. They are attracted to carbon dioxide, which means they often target humans and animals for their blood meals. Midge bites can be particularly annoying for outdoor enthusiasts or those that have waterfront homes as they can ruin pleasant evenings outdoors. Midges breed in moist and sandy areas such as beaches, marshes, and wetlands and lay their eggs in the sand. If if you have a lake in the back like I do, you know what I'm talking about. While midges are a natural part of the ecosystem and serve as a food source for fish and other animals, their presence is definitely annoying. To avoid midge bites, it is recommended to wear long sleeve shirts and pants, use insect repellent, and avoid being outdoors during peak midge activity times, which are usually in the early morning and the late afternoon. Additionally, installing fine mesh screens on windows and doors can help keep midges out of homes and buildings. Do you know which state is number one for termites? You guessed it, it's Florida. First off, let's talk about the types of termites you might encounter in Florida. There's the subterranean 
the dry wood, and the damp wood. But let's be real, they're all pretty much a pain in the butt. Subterranean termites are the most common and they're the ones you really need to watch out for. They tunnel through the ground and can make their way into your home through cracks or any other little openings that they can find. So what can you do to protect your home from termites? Well. First things first, get your home inspected regularly by a licensed pest control professional. They'll be able to spot any potential termite problems and give you some advice on what you can do to prevent them. Another thing you can do is make sure any wood that's in contact with the ground is treated or removed. Termites love to snack on wood and they'll start eating away at any wood that's in contact with the soil. So don't give them a free meal, guys. But last but not least, keep an eye out for any signs of termite activity such as discarded wings, mud tubes, or hollow sounding wood. If you suspect you have a termite infestation, don't wait. Call in the pros and have them take care of it ASAP. Trust me, it's better to spend a little money now than to have to spend a lot of money later on. You definitely want to keep termites from turning your home into sawdust if you're planning to live in Florida. If you're planning on purchasing a home here, financing a home in Florida with termites can be a challenge. Since lender and insurance companies may require certain inspections and treatments to be completed before approving your loan or providing coverage, here are some things you should know. Number one, lenders may require a termite inspection. Most lenders will require a termite inspection to be completed before approving a loan. If the inspection reveals termite damage or infestation, the lender may require treatment to be completed before moving forward with the loan. Number two, insurers may require termite coverage. Homeowners insurance policies in Florida may not cover termite damage, so some insurers may require termite inspection and treatment before providing coverage. Be sure to check with your insurer to see what their requirements are. Number three, treatment can be expensive. Termite treatment in Florida can be expensive, especially if the infestation is severe or widespread and you need to fumigate. The cost of treatment may need to be factored into your budget when considering financing options. Number four, FHA loans have specific requirements. If you're obtaining an FHA loan, there are specific requirements related to termite inspections and treatments. For example, the inspection must be completed by a licensed pest control professional and treatment must be completed if evidence of termite activity is found. Number five, VA loans may require wood destroying insect report. If you are a veteran obtaining a VA loan, a wood destroying insect report, WDI, may be required. This report will identify any termite or other wood destroying insect activity in the home and may require treatment before the loan is approved. Overall, financing a home in Florida with termites can be more complex than a home without termite activity, but it's definitely doable and your agent should know how to navigate the situation. Okay, on to our next negative. According to data collected by insure.com, Florida leads the nation with the highest auto insurance premiums. If you're coming from New York or California, you're used to the high cost of insurance, but if you are relocating here from, let's say, Ohio or Oregon, you will be in for a surprise when shopping for an auto policy. So why exactly is auto insurance so high here? One reason is because Florida is known for its high number of uninsured or underinsured drivers. According to the Insurance Information Institute, in 2019, 20.4% of Florida drivers were uninsured, which is the highest rate in the United States. This means that if you're in an accident with an uninsured driver, you'll likely be stuck paying for damages out of your own pocket. To protect themselves from these potential losses, insurance companies in Florida have to raise their rates to offset the risk. Secondly, Florida has a no-fault insurance system, which means that drivers are required to carry personal injury protection, PIP coverage. This coverage is designed to pay for medical expenses, lost wages, and other related expenses if you're injured or in an accident, regardless of who is at fault. However, the problem with the system is that it's a prone to fraud. There have been numerous cases of individuals staging accidents or exaggerating injuries to collect PIP benefits. This fraud results in higher costs for insurance companies and those costs are then passed on to consumers in the form of higher premiums. Thirdly, Florida is susceptible to natural disasters such as hurricanes and floods. In fact, According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Florida has had 304 federally declared disasters since 1953, which is more than any other state. These disasters can cause significant damage to vehicles and insurance companies must factor in the increased risk when setting their rates. Lastly, Florida has a high population density, especially in major cities like Miami and Orlando, with more people on the roads, including tons of elderly people, college students, and tourists on the road 
there's a higher likelihood of accidents occurring and insurance companies have to account for the risk when setting their rates. Okay, I get a lot of questions about crime in Florida and today we're gonna discuss. Now, when we hear the term white collar crime, we often think of Wall Street bankers and corporate executives, but did you know that Florida has the highest rate of white collar crime per capita in the entire United States? According to the Federal Bureau of Investigations, 2020 crime in the United States report, Florida had 33,146 reported incidents of white collar crime, a 4.6% increase from the previous year. That's a lot of white collars turned into orange jumpsuits. So what exactly is white collar crime? It typically involves financial fraud or other illegal activities committed by business professionals or government officials. Examples include embezzlement, money laundering, insider trading, wire fraud, and identity theft. Florida has seen its fair share of high-profile white-collar crime cases. One infamous example is the Ponzi scheme run by Bernie Madoff, which defrauded investors out of billions of dollars. Another is the Medicare fraud scheme run by Miami businessman Philip Esformes, which resulted in a $1.3 billion settlement with the government. When it comes to specific types of white-collar crime, occupational fraud is a major concern. This is when an employee steals or misuses company assets for personal gain. In Florida, occupational fraud is the most common form of white collar crime. On average, it takes 14 months for occupational fraud to be detected and the median loss is 150,000. But it's not just businesses that are at risk. Individuals can fall victim to white collar crimes as well. Identity theft is a common type of white collar crime and it's on the rise in Florida. In 2020, the state had the second highest number of identity theft reports in the US. Another form of white collar crime that's particularly concerning in Florida is wire fraud. This occurs when a cyber criminal intercepts money transfers during real estate transactions. In 2018, a study by the Federal Bureau of Investigations found that Florida ranked third in the country for the number of reported wire fraud incidents with over a thousand victims losing a total of $57 million. Wire fraud can have devastating consequences for individuals who are buying or selling a home. It's important to be aware of the signs of wire fraud such as unexpected emails or changes in wiring instructions and to verify all information with trusted sources before transferring any money. But it's not only Florida. Did you know that wire fraud occurrences are highly correlated with population densities. According to reports, states with large populations tend to be the receiving location for domestic wire fraud occurrences with California, New York, Texas, and Florida being the top states for receiving fraudulent wire payments. White collar crime can have a devastating impact on victims, especially small businesses. In fact, 20% of small businesses that fall victim to fraud go bankrupt as a result. It also erodes trust in our financial systems and can lead to losses of jobs, retirement savings, and investments. And let's not forget the cost of investigations and legal proceedings, which can be astronomical. So what can we do about it? The FBI recommends that individuals and businesses take steps to protect themselves, such as educating themselves on common scams and frauds, regularly checking financial statements for discrepancies, and reporting any suspicious activity to the authorities. Florida is one of the states most affected by rising sea levels, and this has significant implication for the state's real estate market. So let's explore what's happening in Florida and what it means for homeowners and investors. Firstly, let's look at the facts. According to a report from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, sea levels in Florida have risen by about eight inches since 1950. This rate of sea level rise is expected to accelerate in the coming decades with some estimates projecting a rise of up to two feet by 2060. This rise in sea levels due to a combination of factors including climate change, melting ice caps, and thermal expansion of the ocean. Secondly, the impact of rising sea levels on real estate in Florida is already being felt. Properties in low-lying areas are at a higher risk of flooding and storm damage, making them less attractive to buyers. In some cases, Homes in flood-prone areas have already lost value with one study estimating that Florida homes in areas at risk of flooding have lost $5.4 billion in value since 2005. Thirdly, the recent collapse of the Champlain Tower South in Surfside has brought attention to the impact of rising sea levels on buildings in Florida. A researcher who studied the building warned that rising sea levels could have contributed to the collapse. He explained that when water penetrates concrete and steel, it can cause corrosion which weakens 
the structure over time. This corrosion can be accelerated by exposure to salt water, which is a significant concern in coastal areas like Florida. Fourthly, the insurance industry is also feeling the impact of rising sea levels. Many insurance companies are raising premiums or refusing to provide coverage for properties in high-risk flood zones. This can make it more difficult and expensive for homeowners to insure their properties, which can further decrease their value. Lastly, the impact of rising sea levels on real estate in Florida is not just limited to residential properties. Commercial properties such as hotels, restaurants, and retail spaces are also at risk. These properties may face higher insurance premiums, decreased revenue, and potential damage from flooding and storms. Florida's rising sea levels are already having an impact on the state's real estate market with serious implications for the safety of buildings and the financial well-being of homeowners and investors. Homeowners and investors need to be aware of the risk and take steps to mitigate them, such as investing in flood proofing measures or purchasing properties in higher elevation areas. So that's it for today's video. In addition, downsides of living in Florida. Again, just like any place in the country, there's going to be negatives. I'll continue to explore all of those here on my channel. However, if you weigh the positives of Florida and the negatives, many people find, especially those up north or from California, that the benefits of living here are worth the move. And if you want to know the benefits of living in Florida, be sure to check out my video that explains all of the positives and subscribe for upcoming ones in the future. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you're thinking of making a move, don't forget to also watch this video.